This video will show you how to use the AI Sample Finder Wizard, which is a tool available on the LSM 900 Tonks that makes it very easy to detect the type of sample holder you have, um, as well as detect regions in the sample for which you want to make quick previews. Now, for this to work, all you need is to have your sample on the microscope. You don't need to select a particular objective. Um, you don't need to have looked at it with the locate mode or to have it in focus. You just need it on, uh, on the microscope. Uh, I would suggest that you don't look at a sample with the oil objective before doing AI sample finder. But aside from that, all you need is the sample on the microscope. Once you have that, you go to acquisition and you click the button that says AI Sample Finder Wizard. If this does not say AI Sample Finder Wizard, if it says AI Sample Finder, switch it to AI Sample Finder Wizard, which will trigger the workflow that is useful to most people most of the time. When you click on this, um, this is the dialog that will come up, and you'll have a big button here that says Find Sample. Press that button. When you press that button, you will hear things change on the microscope and you'll see lights hitting the sample. These will make this very low resolution image of the uh, entire, in this case, slide. Um, but if you have a dish, it'll make uh, images of, it'll take images of a dish. If you have a multi-well plate, it'll do images of a multi-well plate. So it will try to detect what kind of what it calls sample carrier you have. So that means, is this a slide? Is this a dish? Is this a multi-well plate? So um, that is what it's trying to find, and that was that sort of blue rectangle that flashed momentarily. Once it detects uh, the kind of sample carrier you have, so slide, dish, multi-well plate, it will try to detect regions inside that sample that you might want to uh, make previews of. So in this case, this sample has a bunch of sections on it, uh, so it tried to detect the sections for us. So sometimes this detection uh, does not work. It detects things incorrectly. Sometimes it just says that it can't detect anything. So in this case, it realized that it did detect things, but they're probably incorrect. So it's giving us this caution uh, value. And this is typical. It, 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 there's nothing particularly wrong or, um, with this sample. Um, it, it, it's simply that um, some samples are harder for it to find than others. If you are in a situation like this, uh, you will probably need to delete any um, regions that are not uh, what you want. So I will delete all three of them. None of them are quite exactly what I want. And I can draw new regions, either with the rectangle, the oval, or the spline contour tool. If I use a spline contour tool, I can do this by clicking and dragging, and then releasing at the end and right clicking, and that will make this object. So you can, uh, that's one way of doing it. Alternatively, um, if I delete this, you can do it by left clicking at different sort of waypoints in the spline contour until you get a shape that's what you want and right by right clicking and closing it at the end. If all your sections are very, very similar, um, you don't need to draw this for each section. For example, here that we have several, you can instead use this cloning tool where um, every time you click, it adds the same um, region to different parts uh, of your sample. And so you can see in this case that sort of simplifies the work. Um, so let's say uh, we're happy with this. This um, is, a, again, a slide with four sections on it. Uh, so we have a, an image of what the slide looks like here. And then we have the regions that we want to look at in a little bit more uh, detail to make some preview images that we can then use to explore the sample further. Uh, we have those uh, regions properly defined, so I'm going to go to the next option. Uh, the next option, it's going to prompt us whether we want to proceed with long-range autofocus. And I would say yes, uh, always answer yes to that. It doesn't always work perfectly, but it can get pretty close and that can simplify uh, focusing on the sample. Um, the if, if it doesn't work, then you have uh, the option to change the focus later. So there's really no harm done beyond the 30 seconds or so that it takes to run uh, this uh, autofocusing. And you'll see if you're sitting at the microscope, there's, you'll, you'll see some lights on it. So you can see here um, that it found 
uh, certain focal positions for the different uh, sections, which we'll be able to evaluate in a second. And they're not all the same. And this is not atypical for uh, a slide like this placed on this inverted scope. Sometimes things can get tilted and the uh, focal positions can drift as you move from left to right. That does not quite seem to be the case here. So let's see. So that one, that one is lower. This one is a little bit higher. This one's much higher. So there doesn't seem to be a clear trend here, but we'll evaluate um, whether these focal positions make sense in a moment. So this, what, call, what it calls the setup scan are these previews or, or little maps that it makes. It uh, by default does them with the 5X objective. I would not change that. And it uses a camera, so it doesn't do this with confocal. And it gives you the option of up to four uh, channels that you can use. One is simple bright field. Another is coherent contrast, which is a, a form of bright field that has a little bit more contrast to it. Um, these are good options if, if the bright field or sort of coherent contrast morphology is sufficient for you to identify the regions that you want to image in more detail. You can also use fluorescence channels. So let's look at these in turn. So if I want to use the bright field, I can go to live. And that will show me uh, what the bright field looks like in that particular region. I must have not clicked it properly. So you can see it's it's sort of not great. And if I go to display here, I can see that it, you know it seems like maybe I'm not having uh, enough light here. So I can increase the exposure to maybe um, 25 milliseconds, for example, and that gives me a slightly better image. I don't have a lot of contrast. Uh, with this imaging technique. I can see a few things, but maybe not enough. So what about uh, coherence contrast? If I switch to that, um, you can see that this is completely blown out as shown in the display histogram by the fact that all my pixel intensities are at the uh, complete maximum that the camera allows. So this exposure is incorrect. Now I could fiddle around and try to lower it, or I can just say set exposure and it'll figure out what an appropriate value is. So you can see this you know, looks a little bit weird, but it does give us more detail um, that we could use to potentially navigate the sample. Now, if that by itself is not enough, or if this is not what you're looking for, you can also do two fluorescence channels. And the way you set these up is very simple. You, uh, let me just stop the live. Oops, there we go. Um, if I say select, I can select whichever fluorophores are in the sample, so this is a particular sample that was kindly provided by the Scott Williams lab that has um, four fluorophores. It has DAPI, uh, far red, uh, something sort of equivalent to Alexa Fluor 568 and uh, Alexa Fluor 488. So I could use any of those channels. So for example, I can say I want to look at DAPI. So if I click on that, uh, just by telling it what fluorophore we want to look at, the system figures out well, what the position of all the right filters is. And if we go to live, it just shows us what the DAPI signal looks like. Uh, alternatively, uh, we could look at another fluorophore. So one nice thing uh, about using this system is that we can make a preview image uh, based on a far red fluorophore, which by eye would be invisible. So for example, this, this sample has something very similar to Alexa 6647. So we could um, make a preview image with that fluorophore, which again, we cannot see by eye. Um, so you can see how useful this might be. And we can make those previews with up to all four of these. Uh, now we only have the option of combining in this kind of preview mode two fluorescent channels. Um, but we can do up to two fluorescent channels and up to four total. Now which ones of these you use? Completely up to you. Uh, I'm just going to illustrate this uh, with the DAPI. Once you ch hit this check mark, it knows that you want to make a preview with that channel, and we can add more check marks to do more channels. For example, I'm just going to do one for the purpose of the video. And then I'm going to say preview scan. When I say preview scan, if I zoom out here by uh, rotating uh, the scroll wheel towards me, I can see the progress of this. So it's making, as you can see here, this is a DAPI preview of the particular region that I told it to do. And you can see it's very, very fast. Um, so it's really worth doing this because um, if you're doing sections, for example, this allows you to see which sections and where in the sections you might want to image very, very quickly before you switch to confocal. Um, if you're doing uh, an analysis of cells, this kind of thing can um, be very useful to detect particular regions where there are cells, for example, on a cover slip. Sometimes cells are distributed non-uniformly on a cover slip. Or even if there are particular cells that are marked with a particular fluorophore, 
you can see where those rare cells might be uh, in, a, in a cover slip that might have only a few of them. So we'll let this finish, and then I will illustrate how you move forward from here. Okay, so it's done. So now I can just click Finish, and it's going to prompt me uh, what I want to do. So please select an experiment for the sample finder. This just means, okay, you have these, now you want to image them, so what do you do? So um, you need to select which conditions um, you want for confocal imaging, so if you, or, or other imaging, as it were. So I'm going to select uh, for this sample uh, this particular four-channel setting, which is appropriate. And then I'm going to click on more options and I do want to transfer the detected sample carrier template so that means I want to transfer that image of the slide. I don't want to transfer the detected sample regions to advanced tile setup so that means you would do that if you then want to take higher resolution images of all these sections which we don't want and I don't want to replace any existing tile regions or remove positions but if you wanted to do those things just check the appropriate boxes. So if I now say OK um, this will switch from this sample finder wizard to the acquisition tab in the software, as you'll see in a moment. And uh, we now have this image here that we can navigate through. So if I press the, the scroll wheel button, this is a little bit confusing, but we can navigate by pressing the scroll wheel button. This is a representation of where we are right now. I can switch, for example, to the 20x objective and navigate, let's say I'm interested in this particular part of the sample. I can double click and navigate there. It will go all the way over there. Uh, and now, for example, um, if I switch to the DAPI channel and go live, I can see what it looks like right there. Now this has uh, a particular thing that's a little bit annoying, which is by default, it shows you the result of the imaging in this little window. Usually we don't want that. We want this to show up kind of next to it. And so we can make that happen by clicking here on navigation and saying separate container. If we do that, when I hit live again, it will show up here. Now, you can see I don't see anything there, so if I click on it, uh, that will be the display conditions for, for this. And you can see there's pretty much nothing there. Um, even if I hit best fit, you sort of can't really see much. Um, so what I will do is I'll switch it to range indicator, or at least I can see some gray, and I will uh, change the focus. So. Uh, this is a good time to also explain that you can change the focus not only by moving the focus knob on the microscope or on the, uh, the one that's attached to the touchscreen, but also if you hit, if you hover on this image and hit the control key, you'll be able to change the focus by moving the scroll wheel. So that's what I'm doing. It's on medium speed, so it's not changing very much. I'm actually turning the scroll wheel very quickly to get any kind of change, but I could move to, for example, fast, rotate it, and then now we get... Uh, uh, faster changes and if I hit best fit you can see that I've managed to focus on this and so now you can see um, what this looks like with the 20x on the confocal and I can then look at other channels uh, this one does not seem particularly bright in this region uh, this one does not seem to have uh, well uh, rather has a different kind of staining and then uh, you can see the 647 um, looked at the sample before so I know for example that there's some some signal in these kinds of objects in the sample and you can see there how those uh, light up and how well aligned the preview image is to um, the confocal image so I hope that illustrates how useful the AI sample finder is it allows you to circumvent completely looking at the sample by eye uh, and it allows you to make these very useful maps for navigating it afterwards. Um, you can then do combine this with all sorts of different uh, tiles modalities by drawing regions, by putting uh, random regions. So it can be combined with everything else, but it's a very useful uh, first step with which to start each of your experiments. I will now illustrate how to use a preview image created with AI Sample Finder to switch between a preview that was made with an air objective and imaging with air objectives to imaging with an oil objective. So this is something that frequently comes up where uh, you acquire a, a giant preview image um, with an air objective, but then you want to look at subcellular details somewhere in this section or in this region with cells. And so the problem is that to do that, 
uh, we typically, for the highest resolution, need to use a 63x oil objective. To put on oil on the objective, uh, the typical thing that we would do before we had AI Sample Finder is to remove uh, the, the sample itself, switch to the 63x oil objective, uh, put it in the load position, put on oil, put on the sample again, and re-raise it. The problem is that when you remove the sample and you put it back in, it's very hard to get it back in the same position. So if we want to retain this mapping function, we need to find a better way uh, that will allow us to put on the oil without losing uh, this mapping of the sample. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Let's say that we were imaging with uh, 20x 0 0.8 um, air objective. The first step is to lower the objective, this 20x, to its load position. And I recommend you do this here. So if you hit load, that objective will go all the way to the bottom of its region of travel. While still in the load position, you can move, you can see that the 20x objective is currently there, you can move it all the way over here. This is not where um, the sample is. We are still in the load position. I can now switch to the 63x oil, and then I can put on oil, go back here, and then go up to the working position. So it's very important that Bef like after you put on oil, you remain in the load position because if you don't do that, when you move from here, there, what can happen is it can scrape across the edge and damage this very expensive objective. So anytime you are moving the oil objective from here to here or vice versa, let's say you know we look at something here, but then we want to look at something there, we will probably need to re-oil the objective. Make sure you drop it to the load position. And I would say as a matter of of just safety, do that for all the objectives. Whenever an objective goes from outside of the sample to in the sample using this, uh, this view, make sure they are in the load position. So I'm going to put on oil on this objective right now, uh, and I will uh, show you uh, what the images look like when we go back. I've just placed oil on the 63x oil objective, so I am still in the load position. Very importantly, again, I do not want to go up to the working position when I'm moving from this place to this place. I'm going to go back here. All right, you can see where I am. And now that the objective is there, I'm going to hit work. And it will go back up roughly to where it was in focus before. So if I go to the DAPI and go to live, Click here. This is the display for that one. I'm going to click on range indicator and I'm going to hit control and the scroll wheel to change the focus. Let's see if I can get it into focus here. Let me switch to very fast. All right, I'm going down. And here I have found the nuclei at 63x. And I can navigate the sample at this magnification with a map that I made on an air objective before and look at the different um, channels as needed. Now, you want to be a little bit mindful of the fact that you have a limited amount of oil on the objective. So if you go here and then you want to suddenly go to another uh, section, uh, don't do that by just double clicking here because that's going to smear oil all over the middle and you'll probably run out. And it's also not a good idea to move the objective long distances in the working position. So if that happens, what I suggest instead was to lower it to the work position, uh, excuse me, lower it to the load position, move here, put on oil, make sure you're in the load position before you go back, go back, and then when you're in the proper position, go up to the working position. So for long distances, you always want to be in the load position. Be those between slides, between sections on the same slide or on or off the slide. 
I want to illustrate a slightly different scenario using AI Sample Finder, which is when you have a sample that has multiple wells. So this is an example slide that had four chambers. Uh, after the experiment was completed, the chambers were removed from the slide and a cover of slip was placed on it. You can see that after I run the first part of AI Sample Finder, it found these four locations. If I go to Next, it will prompt me whether I want to do long range autofocus. So that's the same as before. We'll do that. But then the next step will be slightly different. And that's what one of the things that I want to illustrate in this video. So the autofocus will take a few tens of seconds to run. It does it on each of the wells. And um, you could see in the previous uh, image as well, uh, in the previous, excuse me, screen as well, it hadn't really found anything. It just found the wells. It didn't find any sections in them or anything like that. And now you can see that it marks the wells in blue. If there were a cover slip, it would also mark the, it would mark the cover slip in blue. If they were multi-well plates, it would mark the wells in blue. Uh, and then there's this yellow. And this yellow is the region uh, over which it's assuming we want to do the preview. And it comes from the fact that the yellow is smaller than, than the blue comes from this fill factor. So this fill factor specifies for the software how much of each well we want to add to the preview. So if I say 90%, that will be almost the entire thing. If I say 100%, will be the entire well. And because the yellow uh, is below the blue, we don't see it. It didn't disappear. It's going to do the whole thing. Um, that was one of the things I want to show you uh, in, in this sort of multi-well scenario. The other is we go to um, these have uh, some green fluorescence this is a very old slide but um, it'll illustrate the point the other issue is what if we want to change the focus that it detected with the long range autofocus how do we do that so for example if i go to this one and i'm not happy with this focus i can refocus however i want that one was actually perfect but let's say we prefer this focal position and then we can say update the Z by clicking here for the selected tile regions and it will update this focus position. I think in this case I didn't change it so let me um, update now. So see how now it has changed. Alternatively we can right click here and say set current Z for selected tile regions and it will change it accordingly. Um, so that's just a way of adjusting the focus of one, or you can select multiple ones and put them in the same focus if that uh, makes sense. Often that doesn't, but if it did, you could do that. And uh, you can set the current Z for whatever it is uh, to, you know, whatever is here will be uh, imported into the different positions. So again, uh, slight uh, sort of subtle things, but useful things to know when using the sample finder wizard.